so uh, the next uh, presenter is is Julie, our mo our co my co moderator, and she'll be talking about planning for the preservation and curation of Artemis returned samples. Julie, thanks, Brad. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for attending today. Um, I'm hoping this presentation will give everyone a nice overview of um, some of the work we're doing in terms of uh, optimizing sample return for Artemis. Um, I also want to uh, just introduce this topic um, as something that um, I hope everyone will think about throughout the day today uh, because one of the goals of this workshop is to get inputs from the community that will directly feed into our plans um, and our designs and all of our work that we're doing right now for Artemis and especially Artemis curation. Um, so next slide please. So the Artemis mandate, I think most folks are familiar with this, but I'm just going to give a very quick overview of the Artemis program um, that the United States will lead the return of humans to the moon for long term exploration and utilization, followed by human missions to Mars and other destinations. And the real key point of of the mandate was the part that said the, that the plan is to return American astronauts to the moon within the next five years. <clears throat> and because this was uh, in 2019, uh, that gives us a target of 2024 for the first uh, landing on the moon in the Artemis program. Next slide. Um, so Artemis is broken into two phases, um, and so I'm not going to go through all the details of each phase here, but I do want to give folks a sense of the architecture. So uh, the first Artemis missions will not be landed missions. Artemis 1 and 2 will be missions to the moon and orbiting the moon um, and uh, preparing us for the first uh, human landing, which will be Artemis 3, and that is the one that is targeted to take place in 2024. So uh, going from left to right on this chart, you can see Artemis 1. Um, some intermediate missions to establish some infrastructure and then Artemis 3 um, on the far right. Next slide. Oh, I think we need to go forward a couple. There we go. Cool, thank you. Um, so Artemis uh, phase two um, is the Artemis four mission and beyond. So Artemis four, five, six, and seven are shown here. This is where we'll have a lot more of the surface operations capability and infrastructure um, that we plan to leverage for surface studies and um, enhanced sample characterization and hopefully sample return on the surface. Next slide. So the mission constraints, um, I know a lot of folks have questions about this, so I want to go ahead and, and put this out there at the very beginning. Uh, we do have a sample return mass, a maximum of 100 kilograms of down mass. Um, this includes all of the return samples, so not just the geologic samples, but any biologic samples that are collected, um, in addition to sample containers, which we estimate will be about 20% of the down mass. And the reason this is the constraint is because this is the human landing system requirement, um, so the lunar lander um, is designed to meet this uh, return mass requirement. So the three companies that are making the commercial HLS um, are shown there on the right, Dynetic, SpaceX, and the Blue Origin National Team. Uh, we also have a return volume constraint, uh, which is 0.16 cubic meters of volume. This is based on Apollo, um, and it is constrained. Um, so this is this is the value that HLS and Orion have been designed to and are working to. And Orion, you can see there on the bottom right. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to go through all of this in detail. Uh, for those of you who were at the previous Lunar Surface System workshop, um, the, uh, this slide was presented by Jake Bleacher and Ben Bussey. So I'm not going to go through the details, but I do want to point out that the um, science objectives for Artemis, there are several that are specifically relevant to sample return. Um, including understanding planetary processes such as differentiation and volcanism on the lunar surface, um, understanding volatile cycles, which uh, Parvati just talked about and, and we will continue to talk about throughout the day today, understanding the impact history of the Earth-Moon system, and understanding the solar activity and how that has changed throughout time. 
And so uh, these are all questions that uh, return samples will help us to answer. And we'll implement these science objectives in several ways. Um, so going kind of from bigger picture to smaller picture, the first thing we want to do is define the science questions that fall within each of these, these objectives. Um, and so this is where we're really looking to all of you throughout the day today to get your questions that you want to know about specific impacts, about specific uh, volatiles questions, and so on. Now, once we constrain those science questions, then we can say, okay, what samples do we need to collect that will address those science questions? And that will help us to feed into the surface operations plans um, and the sample collection tools and containers that will be designed, uh, that are being designed to collect the samples and bring them home. Now, following up on that, what laboratory measurements, measurements will need to be made on those samples that we're going to collect? And then what are the analytical constraints of that instrumentation? And all of that drives us to how do we limit contamination? How do we select materials and design the hardware, um, not just in flight, but also in the curation labs to um, facilitate all of the measurements and all of the analyses that you all will wanna do on the samples when they come back. Next slide, please. So the goals of Artemis curation are, are threefold. Um, I kind of broadly categorize them as uh, these three. So first of all, we wanna preserve the Artemis samples in flight. So that's from collection on the lunar surface to their return to Earth. So a lot of people may have the, the uh, idea that curation only happens on the ground and in a clean lab, but curation actually begins at the beginning of the mission. And so we really wanna make sure that sample preservation is a focus for Artemis and that we implement uh, hardware and operation strategies that maximize sample preservation throughout the mission in flight. We also uh, want to provide initial sample characterization and a sample catalog uh, to enable your scientific studies of the samples. And so for those of you who have studied Apollo samples or meteorites or other astro materials, um, this is a process that you're very familiar with in terms of um, sample requests and using the catalogs that we've established in the curation office. Finally, we want to curate the samples for the long term, um, and this is something that we are uh, experiencing now through the Apollo Next Generation Sample Analysis Program or ANCSA program, um, that by curating the samples in a, in a very pristine, uh, clean way, uh, we are actually facilitating future investigations using instrumentation and analytical techniques that don't exist today. Next slide, please. So uh, to get a little bit more uh, specific, um, so I'm going to go into preservation um, and, and all of the, the three categories I just mentioned in a little more detail. Um, so sample preservation in flight, it applies to all phases of the mission. So it's kind of a, a, a little bit maybe opposite of what folks are used to. So going from right to left here, we're going to go from the moon back to Earth. Um, and so from collection on the lunar surface, um, we want to make sure we collect the samples in a clean way, transport them to lunar orbit and from the moon to the Earth in a clean way. Um, and, and preserving the samples and especially for cold samples, we want to make sure they don't get heated up too much. Um, and we want to transport them uh, from Earth orbit to the Earth's surface where we will recover the samples and do our initial uh, characterization and preliminary examination by a science team. Next slide. So in order to implement this sample preservation, uh, we have some broad categories here in terms of uh, preventing contamination of the samples. And so um, if you look at these, uh, I'll, I'll just list a few of them. Uh, we want to limit reactions, chemical reactions between the samples uh, with oxygen and humidity in the atmosphere. This is something we do on the ground by keeping the samples in glove boxes that are purged with dry nitrogen gas. We want to prevent uh, particulate contamination microbial cross-contamination, which is planetary protection. Uh, we want to prevent any kind of organic contamination, uh, which you'll hear about um, in a couple of talks from now. And then for the, the lighter blue boxes at the bottom, those are the unique requirements for cold samples, that we don't want them to heat up too much, we don't want them to chemically react with our materials, and we want to make sure people stay safe when they're working with those materials. Next slide. So in addition to contamination control, we also have contamination knowledge. Uh, really? So we implement this. Yep, got it. Uh, contamination knowledge is accomplished. Um, so first of all, contamination knowledge is, is just documenting the contamination that exists. We do this by flying witness plates or coupons. So this is a picture from Dworkin et al. 2018 of a witness plate. Um, and we also have a good materials inventory of what the samples will be exposed to. Next slide. <clears throat> 
Oh, I think uh, there we go. Um, so we also want to um, store and preserve the volatile samples. And so this is something we are actively working on at JSC. We are constraining uh, the storage temperature requirements and materials compatibility requirements um, in the lab with simulated uh, lunar volatile rich materials. And we are also soliciting input from the community in terms of uh, cold technologies that we can fly to keep the samples cold in flight. Next slide. We're also developing techniques for sample characterization. This is something we've done for solid samples. Um, and we're also working on additional techniques for cold samples that are non-destructive um, and rapid in case we have uh, short shelf life materials. And I'll very quickly go through the next uh, slide and then I'll stop there. So next slide, please. Um, so our long-term sample storage. Um, so we obviously want to uh, facilitate long-term analyses of the samples. Um, our storage requirements are something that we are developing and, and your inputs today will help us to define those. We are preparing for both ambient temperature and cold and cryogenic sample storage. Um, and a lot of folks are wondering where the samples will be stored. Uh, we are working on plans for an Artemis curation facility. Uh, we could use existing or new facilities, uh, but we are uh, working on those and we'll have some decisions on that hopefully uh, later this year from headquarters. And if you go to the next slide, I'll just leave it there. And I know I'm over time. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Julie.